Uh, all right, with that, I will uh, introduce uh, J Dr. Jim Calley uh, from Promega. Uh, he is the research director um, of the division of assay design at Promega. Uh, the group uses optical technologies um, to de uh, and novel tools to develop in vitro uh, cellular analysis assays. Uh, the key area of focus include uh, key areas of focus include cellular health, ADME, and cell signaling research. Uh, prior to joining Promega, uh, he was assistant professor at the Weiss Center for Research, uh, studying, studying cyclic AMP and Kalmodian dependent signal transduction. His postdoctoral work focused on andelate classes and heterotrimeric G protein, proteins. Uh, James received his PhD in 1991 from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Department of Molecular Genetics. His dissertation work focused on the role of cytochrome P450s in, in heterable, heterable human diseases. Uh, James has authored uh, 50 journal articles uh, and book chapters and is an inventor for eight issued and 19 pending uh, U.S. and European patents. Thank you, James. <coughs> Thank you. And Heather never introduced herself. This is Heather Bartz, from my colleague from Promega. Thank you for the nice introduction. And okay, so um, I'm going to talk today about um, in vitro cytotoxicity testing. As Heather said, I'm a director at Promega, so I'm going to give you kind of a Promega perspective. I'm not going to. I'm going to try to really avoid giving you a, a big long infomercial here. Um, but what I'd like to accomplish is to talk about um, how we illuminate cell function and dysfunction with assay chemistries and hopefully um, help us to understand how we can get out from under the proverbial lamppost um, where um, perhaps an initial um, what seems ob obvious observation uh, eventually as we look a little deeper turns out to be um, not enough. Uh, not comprehensive enough and perhaps even misleading. Um, so by optical assays, I'm typically talking about uh, fluorescence and luminescence, and we'll go through this kind of in a sort of in a, in a, in a way to sort of build one, one step on another. But um, just as a quick intro, I'll, I'll do a, a sort of history lesson here of toxicity testing through the ages. I mean, if you go back to about 2700 uh, BCE, um, there's this guy, uh, Shen Nung, who's known as the father of Chinese medicine. And, um, you know, the question is, how do we test for toxicity? And he said, well, I don't know, I'll just, I'll just try some of this stuff. And he's said to have tested over 365 herbs. Uh, I guess that's one a day for a year. Uh, if you'll excuse the pun, the fatal flaw in this approach is that he's also said to have died from a toxic overdose. So um, clearly, uh, it probably worked to a certain extent, but uh, maybe uh, something better um, could be found. So if you move forward uh, several years, we find none other than Cleopatra, and I'm sure there were others like her who said, I'm not putting myself at risk. But on any given day, she had prisoners and poor people that she um, experimented with, apparently with things like strychnine and, and other poisons. So um, in the modern age, we might not look kindly on that. So we'll fast forward quite a ways um, to 1927 in a seminal publication by Trevan. And this is where we um, sort of move forward with the concept of LD50s, using animal testing and calculating statistically relevant parameters from an experimental population of animals. And so we still do that, and that's become part of um, uh, sort of the paradigm for toxicity testing. But we've also moved uh, forward from that um, in ways that are, um, are um, described in this document from the National Research Council from 2007, Toxicity Testing in the 21st Century. And this emphasizes the shift from animal to cell-based systems with an emphasis on mechanistic uh, studies. So what's this look like? Well, um, in vitro versus in vivo. We're typically talking about cultured cell studies. Um, they're more time and cost effective than animal studies. They mitigate ethical concerns with animal studies. They do enable detailed mechanistic studies. Um, 
the next line I put an exclamation point but also a question mark. And that's, they're more predictive than animal studies. And um, that question mark is there because um, that's a tall order. Um, but I think um, if we approach it appropriately and with uh, good understanding of our outputs and uh, complex enough models, um, we can get there quite well. And so the assays typically look like this, cells in a plate, experimental treatments go in, assay chemistries are applied, and assay outputs are collected. And I put that as a plural, because if there's any message I'd like, hope that you take home from this is that our best chance of predicting in vivo toxicity is from not a single assay output or a single dose curve from a single type of assay, but from a toxicity profile. So at Promega, we focused on um, a certain approach, um, the, uh, I, the notion of being non-radioactive is always in play. And I underlined plate-based to, um, uh, to sort of emphasize the co contrast with imaging-based um, technologies. Robert showed you some imaging-based uh, results, and nothing against those. Our particular focus, though, has been on plate-based. And by plate-based, I mean we're looking for assay windows in, say, a plate-reading luminometer or a, a fluorometer. So you'd be more likely to get a result like this that shows, see, an induction. This it doesn't really matter. This is a P450 assay. But that's the kind of data we're looking for. Uh, we want it to be scalable and automatable, which um, is in the spirit of why we're here today and talking about high throughput screening. Again, we want them predictive. And one of the ways that we're going to do that is to engineer in multiplex options. And I'll talk about that in more detail as we move through this. And we want to make it very simple, add then read format. So this is illustrated in this cartoon here, so that we're not doing a lot of manipulations. Every manipulation you make, um, creates an opportunity for variability and error. So the simpler, the better. Um, we don't always get to uh, pull it off with sort of a one step, but that's what we'd like to do. Um, so um, we've spent a lot of time as a company focused on this. Back in the uh, early 90s, we put out the first assay um, in a portfolio, what became a portfolio of, of in vitro cytotoxicity assays. It was simply a, um, a um, kit-based um, system for the uh, MTT assay. Since then, we've added quite a bit. Um, and I'm not going to attempt to go through all of this, but um, there are various um, assay chemistries that use color, fluorescence, bioluminescence, and sometimes combinations of these for multiplexes. And I, I was giving a talk like this um, I don't know, several months ago to a group from a pharmaceutical company, and the director from the group said, geez, I mean, why, I mean, why do you do, have you stuck with doing so much of this? You thought maybe in the red zone here you might have kind of gotten tired of it. And, you know, I thought about that after, after they left, and uh, to me it's sort of like this. When I was a kid growing up, we had a telephone that looked like that. And it served a certain purpose. I could call my dad at work, or I could call a friend across town, and on a rare occasion, maybe even make a long distance call. But we, don't ha we have these now. And I think that's what we're trying to do here, and that's a metaphor for what we're trying to do here. We're continually trying to push the envelope forward so that we can get better data, um, better assay outputs, so that we can make uh, better conclusions and more biologically relevant predictions. Okay, so these are some of the questions I'll go through. Um, I like to use this phrase, morbidity and mortality in the culture disk. We're not always looking necessarily at dead cells, um, but maybe we're looking at sick cells. So we'll talk about um, how we look at and, and then quantitate the live cell content of a plate, the dead cell content, if they're unhealthy or dead, what changed. Um, and this is a uh, area that I can referred to broadly as mechanistic toxicity. So let's start with cell viability. And um, I have uh, sort of two um, uh, types of assays that I'll talk about here that are 
that, that, that look at a, a metabolic biomarker of cell viability. And ATP is one of them. Um, the assay principle here is that live cells maintain ATP levels. Dead cells lose their ATP. Therefore, ATP levels correlate to live cell number. And by the way, it's very easy to detect with firefly luciferase, which is an ATP-dependent um, enzyme. It produces light in proportion to ATP. So we can configure reagents that enable us to link light to ATP. It has pros and cons. It's extremely sensitive, fast and simple in the spirit of that add and read goal that I talked about, scalable um, up to 1536 or even 3456 well plates and it's non-radioactive. Um, cons, it is an endpoint assay. These are typically detergent-based formulations that kill the cells. It's the last thing you'll ever do with those cells. And by the way, ATP variations do not strictly correlate to cell viability. So there are treatments that can cause the ATP to go up or down that don't necessarily um, tell you that the cells divided or the cells died. So, and we'll get into that also. Um, so our assay uh, is called Cell Titer Glow. It, it, it's very fast. It's a 10-minute add and read assay. It can detect as few as about five cells. Um, it's very robust. It uses an engineered luciferase that's um, been designed through mutagenesis to be thermostable and stable to a fairly harsh uh, reagent formulation. That formulation minimizes the number of false hits, i.e. things like luciferase inhibitors. As it turns out, they're surprisingly rare with this type of formulation. It has glow kinetics. That means we add in, in a few minutes, it goes to a steady state of light output that stays constant for quite a while. The half-lives of these are in the, in, the, in the realm of about five hours. And again, it's this add and read format. And this is actually a whole family of products. Um, the classic assay that I just described was modified for bacterial lysis, which are harder to break open than eukaryotic cells. Uh, there's some different uh, configurations in big bottles that make life easier for you. We recently put one out called Cell Titer Glow 2.0 that has very long shelf life. Um, uh, this one uh, for 3D culture is one I'll, I'll spend a few more minutes on. I'm not going to tell you any more about the rest of them. And the reason I'm going to dwell on this is because we are talking about in vitro assays to predict the in vivo effects of compounds. And there's been a lot of effort in recent years to move past the 2D culture models into 3D under the uh, supposition that life happens in three dimensions. And certainly we should be able to recapitulate uh, in vivo situations in a much better way with a 3D culture. Problem is that a lot of the assay chemistries that are out there, I should say most, if not all of them, were designed for 2D cultures. So how do those play in 3D? Well, some of them work okay, some of them not so much. And what we found is that the cell titer glow, the ATP detection formulations that were out there, didn't do so well at quantitating or getting at all the ATP in a typical 3D model. So this is a hanging drop model by a company called Insphero. Um, this is a, what they call a micro tissue. It's uh, 280 microns in this picture here. And it's, it's a lot of cells. It's a couple thousand cells. And when we applied sort of a traditional ATP assay to that, um, we found that we could only get at the ATP around the edges. And this green dye here indicates lysed cells. It's a dye that we call cell tax green that'll come up later. Um, and, but we couldn't get at the ATP in the middle. And we estimated we were only accessing about 27% of the ATP. So by sort of revving up the formulation of our assay, we're able to get up to about 93% in, these, um, in, the, in this model. And we've applied it to a number of 3D models and found su uh, superior performance. Um, on that. But again, it blows the cells to smithereens. It's an endpoint assay, and we're saying we're doing that on steroids here with this formulation. But that's what it needs to do. Okay, another way to look at viability um, is with another bio, uh, metabolic biomarker, that's cellular reducing capacity. The principle is that live cells main, maintain reducing capacity. They uh, maintain a reducing environment, both chemically and also through the expression of reductases. 
Um, dead cells lose that capacity very rapidly. Therefore, reducing capacity correlates to live cell numbers. So there are many optical probes that are used to detect this and to correlate it with, with viability. Most notably, perhaps, are the tetrazoleum salts. That's MTT, things like MTS, and a few others, XTT, the water-soluble tetrazoleums. And then also resazarin um, is uh, referred to commercially as either Alamar Blue or our product is called Cell Titer Blue. Um, and uh, these um, have some pros and cons. Um, relatively simple protocols. They're scalable, um, more or less homogeneous. Um, sort of add the reagents. You don't have to take anything out. Uh, one thing I mean when I say homogeneous is just that. It's add only. Um, and they've been around for a long time. So there, you may be motivated to stick with these because you have legacy data. And, um, and uh, you want to correlate what you're doing today with what you did a few years ago. Uh, cons, um, like ATP, they're endpoint assays. Uh, they tend to destroy cells. I'm going to show you a, a new um, uh, cellular reducing capacity assay that does not do this a little later in the talk. But these tend to destroy the cells. Um, they may be limited in sensitivity. Uh, Non-homogeneous, say for MTT, and what I mean there is not strictly in sync with the definition I just gave you, but MTT forms a precipitate that has to be dissolved in a, uh, usually a detergent formulation. So it's a, a bit more, a bit less simple. Um, and um, when you compare these different tetrazoleums and resazarin, the, the, the mechanisms whereby they're, they're reduced can vary. So there's a, a researcher from Australia named Barrage who's published a number of papers on this. We find out that depending on which one you use, it's either reduced um, by uh, activities in the mitochondria or by activity associated with the ER or the cytoplasm, or even in some cases with, with this, uh, the plasma membrane. So a little bit all over the map. And again, redox variations don't strictly correlate with cell viability. There are things that alter the redox state of the cell that will change the output of these assays um, in ways that don't necessarily correlate with uh, cell death or cell viability. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I would say, though, that the change in that redox capacity of the cells is telling you that something's going on. So it's not a total con here that it's, it's not perfectly correlated. Um, and I could say the same thing about ATP. If you've got something that's dropping the ATP in half, something's happening. Okay, so I said these things tended to be toxic. This is an experiment with um, MTT showing cells before and after a four-hour treatment. You can see they're all kind of withered up like raisins here. And these crystals here are the, um, the uh, tetrazoleum is converted to a formazan product that's insoluble. And that's what you're seeing there. These are in 3T3 cells. Same, similar outcome with resazarin uh, without the, the crystals, but you can see the, the cells uh, withering up and dying here. And again, this is with a four-hour exposure. So that's all well and good. Um, we were interested, though, in developing a marker of viability that was non-metabolic that was not going to shift up and down with things like changes in mitochondrial function or redox capacity um, that would be sort of flat when it came to metabolism. And what we found was um, a proteolytic activity, it's aminopeptidase, that's uh, present in live cells. However, when live cells die, that is, they lose membrane integrity, it's rapidly inactivated. And we made this substrate that was selective for that uh, protease, which we call affectionately the live cell protease here. It's glyphy with uh, aminofluorocoumarin. Uh, this is a cell permeable uh, molecule, so we can get fluorescence from the coumarin leaving group. Um, the live cell protease cleaves off this glyphy, which quenches the fluorescence, but that quenching is relieved by that protease, and we get a fluorescent molecule that can be detected and that fluorescence evolves in proportion <coughs> excuse me, to the number of live cells. It's very sensitive, has low toxicity, and it's multiplex friendly. And I want you to keep that in mind as we kind of move to the next slide. 
I'm going to kind of change gears now, but I'm going to come back to this. Uh, oh, uh, this is showing the, the lack of cytotoxicity. And we wanted that lack of cytotoxicity because we wanted to be able to do more with the cells than just one endpoint. <coughs> it's all over with sort of scenario. So there it is, four hours after exposure, very little toxicity or not, none that's obvious. And here to take it a step further, there's the traditional reagents. On the scale here is percent of recommended concentration. So at 100% in a 24-hour exposure, all of these reducing capacity probes are causing substantial toxicity, <clears throat> whereas our new cell titer floor, as we call it, um, glyphi AFC at 24 hours is relatively non-toxic. So we have a nice window there where we can do other things with the cells. Okay, now I'm going to change to cell death before I come back to that, that uh, last slide. So how do we measure cell death? First of all, um, a working definition for cell death is a loss of membrane integrity. Uh, for example, here there's a hole in this cell. That's an apoptotic cell. Um, uh, they, loss of membrane integrity can be measured in a couple different ways, and of course this is, again, this is not exhaustive, but it's a few things that I want to talk about today. Leakage markers, which tend to be enzymes, and uh, for example, DNA dye. Robert talked about propidium iodide. I'll tell you about um, our cyto, uh, cell tox green dye. <clears throat> Lactate dehydrogenase is the most popular leakage marker. Uh, GAP-DH and adenylate kinase have been used, but those have really fallen out of favor in, over the last uh, decade or so. And then a protease. And again, uh, I want to uh, tell you a little more about that. This is something we developed at Permega, and kind of the same uh, vein as the live cell protease I talked about, we identified a dead cell protease. So this is a protease that's present in cells that leaks out when the membrane is uh, broken and it remains unlike the live cell protease which becomes inactive as soon as the cell dies. This one is very stable in medium. So we needed for that impermeable substrates. We only want to measure it once it's leaked out of cells and we developed this ala ala phi construct in both the fluorescent and a luminescent mode. <coughs> fluorescent is a rhodamine 110, um, the dead cell protease cleaves the peptide, unquenches the rhodamine, and you get uh, fluorescence. Um, in, the, in the luminescent mode, we put aminoluciferin on there, and the aminoluciferin is detected with a luciferase formulation. Um, so again, it's sensitive, it has low toxicity, and it's multiplex friendly. Um, here's how it looks um, in terms of um, the half-life as a marker. And this is one of the limitations of leakage markers as, as enzymes in general, in that they do have a half-life, they're enzymes, so you're only ever going to be able to measure uh, cytotoxicity within a relatively limited time frame. So you can see here that the protease and the LDH um, have a half-life of about 10 to 12 hours, but if you wanted to do a long-term exposure, say 24, 48 hours, all the cells that died on the first day, um, those are going to be invisible to you because the marker is gone. Um, but it's a limitation of these assays. Nevertheless, um, there's great utility for these things. Um, now, these, the protease and the LDH look very similar here. But there's one important difference here that brings the protease um, into, the, uh, into a better light. Um, so we're looking at a fluorescent uh, LDH assay and a luminescent uh, protease assay, the cytotox protease. And you can see here, as we titrate in dead cells, as we increase the amount, there's a tremendous increase in sensitivity for the cytotox glow assay. And the reason for that is a very simple, if not mundane, reason. And that's that the fetal bovine serum that we use in cell culture has LDH in it that creates a substantial background that limits the assay window. Uh, and in contrast, it doesn't have this prote proteolytic activity. So um, it becomes a very sensitive way to measure cytotoxicity under typical culture conditions where serum is present. 
So now I want to come back to that concept of a multiplex uh, scenario. So by multiplex, I mean reading multiple endpoints from a single well. And I'm going to come kind of full circle back to the live cell assay. Um, and we've thought of multiplex combinations that alternate different forms of luminescence that uh, mix luminescence with fluorescence. And fluorescence and fluorescence when the wavelengths are um, adequately separated. So typically, um, our, our sort of default mode is to uh, put cells in plates, run a single assay, and throw the plate away. And what we're saying is, don't throw the plate away. <laughs> There's more information in there if you've got the right assays. And keep in mind uh, my early slide where I said, what will really enable us to predict in vivo is a toxicity profile. And that's kind of what we're building towards here. So here's an interesting contrast. And this is the live cell protease with the dead cell protease. Um, these can be run uh, simultaneously in the same plate. We simply switch wavelengths when uh, uh, filters, if in fluorescent mode, between uh, the rhodamine probe and the AFC probe. Or if we use the luminescence, um, which we did, uh, uh, I think, let me see here. One of these is lumin uh, luminescence here, sorry. Uh, luminescent uh, cytotoxicity probe. We can look in, in fluorescent mode first at viability, and then in luminescent mode at cytotoxicity. So here's a compound we titrate it in, and we kind of see what you might intuitively expect, is that it toxicity kicks in, um, the viability marker goes down with a reciprocal increase in the cytotoxicity marker. Um, OK, that's all well and good. But if we go over here with this drug, camptothecin, um, we see that viability is going down with a dose of the drug. Um, so with that alone, we might infer that we're killing cells. But in fact, there's no reciprocal increase in the cell death marker. What that tells us is that we're not really killing cells. We're just stopping their division. So the cells from this sample had been allowed to divide basically uninhibited um, at the very low or zero concentration, whereas out here, um, cell proliferation is ground to a halt. Um, so they're still alive. Uh, the dead cell marker tells you that. So these are two very different toxicity profiles, if you will, just by measuring two parameters. OK? Now in the same theme, I want to introduce apoptosis. This is an apoptosis assay that we developed several years ago. It uses a luciferin derivative. That's D-luciferin. Well, it's actually amino luciferin. It has peptide that quenches its activity with luciferase. DEVD is recognized by caspase 3,7. It's cleaved off. We get luciferin in proportion to the amount of caspase 3,7, which is a marker for apoptosis. It's a very sensitive assay. Um, it's a homogeneous add and read format. Now, it is an endpoint uh, lytic assay. But we can combine this with those two proteolytic markers in a, in, a, in a triplex assay that, again, can add to our toxicity profile. So we measure fluorescence with two different filters for viability and toxicity. Then we switch in a multi-mode instrument to um, bioluminescence and read um, apoptosis. So it looks like this. Here's ionomycin. Um, it kills cells through primary necrosis. There's no apoptotic induction. We see the loss of viability, the gain of the death marker, and no increase in the apoptosis marker. In contrast, paclitaxel, as you'd expect out of a cancer drug, has the reciprocal relation between the viability and death marker but it also shows the apoptotic induction. So now we know a little more about this compound. It's cytotoxic. We know what its IC50 is against these cells under these conditions. And we know that it induces um, apoptosis as on its route to cell death. OK, so Robert showed a picture of Paracelsus. I used to have the same picture in here. And this is like the third time I've seen that picture. It's out on the internet. And people that talk about tox like to steal it and put it in their slides. And I would have had it in here too. But um, 
I don't know, I had too many slides. So Paracelsus said the dose is the toxin, but time is also an important parameter. It's exposure time and dose that really um, uh, are important in any kind of in vitro tox setting or an in vivo setting. Um, those of you that have kids probably kept a bottle of something called Epicac in your medicine chest. And so when your kid gets into whatever, the bug spray or something like that, you very quickly give this to them and it makes them vomit. So you're reducing the exposure time. Um, so the typical uh, in vitro assay from a given set of samples can measure dose or it can measure a time course, but it can't do both. You have to pick a time. Or pick a bunch of, t look at it a bunch of times, but pick a dose. So we wanted to come up with chemistries that would allow us to do both, time and dose, from uh, a given set of samples. So the first thing was this Celtox green dye, which I've already mentioned. It's a dye our chemists made. It's impermeable to the cell membrane, and it's environmentally sensitive, which means it has very low fluorescence on its own floating around in the medium. But when the membrane integrity is lost, it enters the cells, and it has a high affinity for DNA, which causes it to fluoresce at a much higher rate. And um, we call this a no-step assay um, because you can just put it in the medium, and it's there if you care to look. You can get a readout by fluorescence on how well your cells are doing. If they stay pretty non-fluorescent, you can assume they're not dying. But if the fluorescence is coming up, um, the, that's an indication that they're dying. Um, it's also a marker with a memory. I told you the leakage markers, the enzymes, have half-lives um, so that you can only look at cell death within a limited window of time. This thing, and here we looked out to 72 hours, uh, remains stably bound to DNA within the plate um, so that as cells die, the signal continues to accumulate. Um, so you've got a real time and call it sort of add, read, 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 read. As many times as you want to look, you can take a look. And here we look three times. 24 hours after adding this dose range of storosporin to a single set of samples, we start to see at the high end some toxicity, uh, 48. A full curve is starting to come into play, and, and we see it again at 72 hours. Um, here we see the IC50 shifting um, from a uh, relatively high number to a much lower number with longer exposure time. So again, that's one set of samples read multiple times. It's a real-time asset. Um, this is the ultimate team player for uh, multiplexing. These are a lot of our assays that it can be uh, put together with. So if you want to look at um, where cell titer glow, ATP, you can also have a orthogonal look at cell death to go along with ATP. Um, our P450 assays, um, our oxidative stress assays, reporter assays, lots of assays. Most of these are in the glow mode, which means they're luminescent using luciferase, but some of them are also fluorescent assays. And that'll just depend on the wavelengths um, and whether the cell tax screen uh, wavelengths are compatible. OK, so that's cell death. Um, we're also interested in real time for cell viability. So this was a little more involved than a simple dye. But at Promega, we have a, uh, a group that does directed evolution. And we recently developed a very small, very bright luciferase that can be purified and it's very stable and we can use it as a reagent in culture dishes. It's called NanoLuck. Um, for that NanoLuck and for this assay, um, we developed a pro-substrate. I'll call it a pro-luciferin here. And it measures cellular reducing capacity, just like those traditional assays I mentioned earlier. The pro or the derivatization on this luciferin is um, sensitive to the reducing environment inside the cell. It's cell permeable. And cells um, crank out or pump out this uh, processed substrate, um, this nanolux substrate, at a rate that depends on the number of live cells in the dish. So we've added this substrate. We've added the luciferase. And we establish light output in a steady state that reflects the number 
of live cells. So when cells die, the reducing capacity is lost, and we get no light for those, those cells. Again, it's an add, read, read, read assay. And here's some data. So here's some cells. They're proliferating. We put these in a, a luminometer that we could program to keep reading over and over again in this experiment. And we looked at them um, every hour for 72 hours, um, varied the number of cells. And what you can see here is the, pro the increased number of cells, the proliferation over this 72-hour time point. Here we did something a little different. Instead of putting it in the fancy instrument, we just took it out of the incubator and read it at progressively later time points. But what this is meant to show, and these are non-proliferative cells, these are cardiomyocytes, that this flat line here represents the steady state luminescence that's characteristic of the number of cells that are in this plate. And it holds steady for quite a while. Here we are at 40 plus hours. But the minute we put a, a potent cytotoxin in, and here it's just digitonin, it's a detergent-like molecule, the signal's immediately lost. So it's, it's sensing viability in real time. Um, OK, so here's the way um, some of the data would look for um, dosing of something that's cytotoxic. And so we've, we've dosed in bortezomib with, um, uh, I think we have 20 concentrations here. It's one set of samples. Um, and we looked at it every hour for 72 hours. Um, and here's the data we got. Here on the top is a sort of zero drug line, and that shows the proliferation, and on down as the uh, concentration of the drug increases. So in real time, we can see what's going on here. Um, if we want to look at the uh, dose dependence, we can pick time points, which I've done here, 8, 24, 48, 72, replot them as a function of dose, and again, we see um, at the early time point, eight hours, nothing much is happening. It starts to show up in about a day. By 48 and 72 hours, you have this fully articulated curve. So to do the, get the same kind of uh, amount of data from a traditional assay, we'd have needed 72 sets of samples. Here we did it all with one set of samples. It can be multiplexed. This shows... Um, here's a drug atoposide, a multiplex with uh, the cell tox green assay showing cell death and viability. Again, um, from a single set of samples, a lot of data um, over a 72-hour period of time. And here's one last thing I'll say about it, and there's a lot of information here. I won't go into it completely. This is, um, we're, we're Assessing toxicity using something called a uh, drug sensitivity score, which just, just simplified, it's basically the area over the toxicity curve. And what it does is it uh, integrates both um, IC50 as well as efficacy. Um, and I just want to make one simple point here, is that if we had looked at all these drugs, and here's a, a list of drugs we looked at, a single time point, let's say 48-hour, 47-hour exposure, um, if you consider this drug, and you consider this drug, in that 48 or 47 hour exposure model, those look exactly the same. High toxicity, red, a red spot. But in fact, the kinetics of, us, of, of this response, as judged by the time dependence, is very, very different. So these are fundamentally different uh, toxicity profiles in terms of potency and in terms of kinetics. OK, this is something that um, uh, I want to go into something that's sort of prototype. Um, and, but to start with, um, I want to point out a problem with using cast space as a marker of um, apoptosis. Um, of course, it's a key biomarker of apoptosis. Um, but the kinetics of the caspase activation often differ between individual inducers and dose, and peak induction may occur at any time. So with an endpoint assay like the one I described, let's say we look at 24 hours, where that pink line is the caspase 3.7. At 24 hours, this will be down to zero, and you'll see nothing. If you look too early, you'll see nothing. What it means is that a priori, you have to have some knowledge of the kinetics of the caspase response to use that endpoint assay most effectively. So 
we wanted to see what we could do to address that. And to do that, um, we've been working with what we call glow sensors for a while now. These are firefly luciferases that have been engineered in ways that um, essentially make them inactive without some processing step. So in this case, the processing step is a DEVD peptide that constrains the configuration away from activity in the light generating reaction. Whoops. Um, and when it's cleaved by caspase, that constraint is relieved and the conformation that's productive for light output um, is allowed to form. Um, so we call it a caspase glow sensor. And it's prototype because it's not in our catalog yet, but it's fully worked out and it's available as a custom. So here's uh, an example of how this can be used in real time. So what we see here is exposure to the caspase inducing ligand trail um, for various amounts of time. You see at the initial look, uh, there's nothing there. Um, but as we move forward in time, we start to see a dose dependent response emerging. And we see the IC50 decreasing or EC50 decreasing with time. Um, we can also look at that um, in a couple of modes. We can look at it in endpoint sort of memory mode. So in that case where you're too late, you missed it, it'd be nice to have an assay that remembers the history of that well. That's shown here. Uh, and we looked at that by just throwing in a, a, uh, a luciferase uh, reaction uh, uh, reagent. And we could see that at 72 hours, even though with a conventional assay, uh, the history of apoptosis would, would be invisible. Here it's, it's retained because that glow sensor maintains activity and it's still present. Now here in real time mode, we're really looking at both the glow sensor response to caspase and also the decline of ATP, which is necessary for the luciferase activity. So we see at 3.5 hours, not much happening. At 6.5, um, you don't really see much. But um, as you move through this, you start to see the response. But then it starts to go away because the cells are dying. So it's a little bit more complex of a, an assay to look at. But it really gives you a lot of information and solves some of that um, issue of knowing when to look. So my last set, and I'll try to get through this quickly because I know I'm taking too much time, is the mechanistic tox assays. And I want to focus on oxidative stress. I talked to you about ATP not always necessarily reflecting cell death. Um, if we think about mitochondrial dysfunction, um, we um, can uh, envision using ATP as a marker of, of, of for drugs that um, uh, uncouple mitochondrial activity or poison the mitochondrial function. So what we have to be able to discriminate with, though, is, is ATP depletion causing cell death or is cell death resulting in ATP depletion um, in this type of an approach? And so what we know with cancer cells is they become quite uh, dependent on glycolysis and very insensitive to mitochondrial toxin. So, but if cells are grown in galactose without going into the details of it, they switch back to their dependence on mitochondria. And then we have a sensitive system for detecting mitochondrial toxins, as shown here with oligomycin. But how do we know whether we're looking at ATP loss due to mitochondrial dysfunction or ATP loss due to cell death? Simply by adding a cell death uh, parameter. So here's a drug that wasn't toxic in this three-hour exposure mod model. And here's one that's characteristic of mitochondrial toxicity. So three hours without ATP isn't enough to kill cells. Um, we see that here. It's a very nice indication that azide, sodium azide, you're all familiar with, is a mitochondrial poison. And we see this over here also with phenofibrate. Um, at the later points, even, the, even there, the cell death starts to come in, uh, late, uh, higher concentrations. So that's a way of using ATP multiplexed with a, a death marker to get at mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, Ross, and I have to show you this because uh, the next speaker, Jay Zhang, is going to talk about 
using ATP, uh, ROS ATP ratios in measuring and identifying drug induced liver injury compounds. Um, we developed a probe that's based on a luciferin molecule that directly reacts with hydrogen peroxide, which is a nice surrogate for most uh, reactive oxygens. Uh, it reacts with the peroxide to form this luciferin molecule, which we detect again with a luciferase reagent. It's basically an add, add, read. The add, add part is we have to add the probe, give it time to incubate, then add the detection reagent. So why did we make this? Well, um, the uh, standard approach that's often used uh, um, relies on a dye called Amplex Red, which uh, depends on horseradish peroxidase. So horseradish peroxidase in the presence of hydrogen peroxide and Amplex Red forms a, a fluorescent uh, product. Problem is, is that a, a HRP is very prone to inhibition by compounds in libraries. So here's a sort of compare and contrast between the Amplex Red assay and the Rosglo luciferase-based assay. Remember, this is direct. It has no need for horseradish peroxidase. And this is just the LOPAC library. Um, and um, what you see here is that with the HRP-dependent approach, we have a tremendous number of false hits. These are HRP inhibitors. Whereas with the luciferase assay, we had four or five that are luciferase inhibitors from this library that we're very familiar with. But we felt like this went a long way to solve that, uh, that interference problem with the HRP assays. So here it is in, a, uh, again, the library screen. We found uh, several compounds um, uh, with that induced ROS in HEPG2 cells. Those were validated as true ROS inducers. And in you know, this multiplex theme, we can multiplex that with ATP. And you'll hear more about this in a minute. But, um, and here we saw something interesting. We looked at two compounds, um, uh, something called menadione, which uncouples mitochondria and causes a production of ROS, and then a compound called pyrigallol, which actually is a nice ROS inducer, but it does this just in the medium. Um, it undergoes redox cycling with components of the medium and makes ROS. So what we saw here is that cell titer glow is a marker of viability with pyrigallol. Basically, we don't see much at all. It wasn't cytotoxic, um, whereas the menadione was quite cytotoxic, while both of them induced ROS to similar levels. So again, in the spirit of profiling and multiplexing, uh, we can make uh, better conclusions about the nature of the response of those compounds. Uh, I think this is the last thing. Um, glutathione is also a measure of oxidative stress. The ratio of the reduced to the oxidized form um, changes in response to um, agents that interfere with the redox potential of the cell. Um, for that, we developed, again, a, a luciferin derivative with an R group that is recognized by a recombinant GST that's part of the assay reagent um, in proportion to the amount of glutathione present in the sample to give light in proportion to glutathione. And we can configure that chemistry in two ways that give us either the reduced or the oxidized form. You can see that here. Again, with that compound menadione, it causes oxidative stress, increases the oxidized form over the, the reduced form, and you have these dramatic shifts in the ratio of GSH to GSSG. And this is, again, in an add and read format that can be multiplexed um, with a viability assay. Here you see starosporin. It causes a decrease in glutathione that may be in large part due just to cell death because the viability is going down. Whereas BSO, it's an inhibitor of glutathione synthesis, um, does cause the glutathione to go down, but at least in a short exposure, i.e. around 24 hours, had no effect on the viability. So the ability to multiplex here really gives you a much better understanding of the glutathione response than you would have with the single parameter assay. So I come back to this, which we talked about at the beginning. Uh, 
hopefully by having multiple assay outputs and, and making that simpler by providing these multiplex options will give us toxicity profiles that if we put our thinking caps on and really consider what we're looking at what, and what their implications are downstream, we can make better in vivo predictions. Um, here's a whole bunch of our assays color coded for fluorescence, luminescence, and multiplex. And we've tried to think about how to fit those together so they can be mixed and matched. And I like to end with our friendly North American firefly that I don't, do you have these around here? We have them all over the place in Wisconsin where I live. So um, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. I don't know what our time's like, if you want to wait or take some now. Okay, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Yes? Assay chemistry, your results are inverse of what you think they should be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm not I'm not real accepting of the word wrong assay chemistry. Um, I think you can interpret the outcome incorrectly um, without um, you know a good understanding of what you're looking at. Um, so again, like um, well, the Ross results. Um, you might assume that, wow, I'm inducing this Ross signal with that compound pyrogallo. It must be a problem for the cells. Well, I'm not saying it's not a problem for the cells, but it certainly didn't kill them um, in that experiment that I showed you. Whereas another compound that di did virtually the same thing was quite toxic. So, um, yeah, but I, I do think that the, the proper assay choice is, is really important. And the choice has to be informed about what it is you want to look at and what you want to learn about the system. So I, I think you're right, Robert, that, that um, with, and, and we certainly see this in interacting with our customers, is that people make the wrong assumptions about assays and call us up and say, well, the assay didn't work. And well, you know, it's just chemistry. The chemistry works. It's, you know, it's more or less the system that you apply it to and what you expect to get out of it. Can you comment maybe a little bit on cause and effect, especially as it pertains to, say, for example, ATP production and apparent toxicity? Yeah, sure. Um, cause and effect. Can you elaborate on what you mean by that? So basically, you had one slide up there that basically showed that um, you're wondering whether you're first depleting the ATP production oh, right, yeah. versus the other way around. You have first toxicity and then the ATP goes away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'll answer it a little differently. And I'm not trying to be a politician or anything. But um, I um, did a study with um, a sort of classic liver toxin, aflatoxin B1. And um, this um, really, um, you can dose it out against hep G2 cells and not see much. But if you dose, do a dose range against hepatocytes, you see a nice dose-dependent toxicity um, using ATP as the marker. And the, you need hepatocytes because they have to biotransform it. But one of the curious, if not interesting, things is that um, the dose range comes down to a plateau of re ATP reduction. The ATP comes down, but it flattens out somewhere north of zero. And the question is, what are you looking at there? Are these cells dead, or did the ATP just go down? Um, and that could mean a couple things. It could mean that you just reduced the ATP. Um, you've impacted mitochondria. You've impacted glycolysis or something like that. Um, it could mean that there's a mixed population of cells in there. Some of them are sensitive to, um, to the toxins. Some of them aren't. Um, but from that single assay, I really can't tell which of those options is the right one. We also noticed in those same studies that you're talking about that uh, depending on what kind of medium the cells are growing on, and the ATP levels can vary quite a bit. I mean, you can have a 50% loss in ATP um, be just between the different medias, and it has nothing to do with viability. So what's the implication there about using ATP as a viability marker? And I say, well, I had a 50% decrease in the ATP signal. Half my cells must be dead. 
Well, you don't really know that until you look uh, at an orthogonal marker, say, for cell death. Um, now, what it tells you is that something's going wrong. The ATP is going down. Something is off that this that your test uh, material is causing. But um, without an additional measurement, it's really hard to make a definitive call as to what you're really looking at. I don't know. I hope that answered the question. It yeah. does. Yeah. It does. Yes. Oh, right. There's a webinar going on. They need to hear you over the microphone. Um, I just want to go back to um, the assay that you um, detect live cells yes. by protease uh, inhibitor. Mm -hmm. um, does the fluorescent um, come out of the cells, or actually the cells remain fluorescent now uh, after cleavage of the dipeptide? Well, that dye is cell permeable. so. I mean, it's, it's freely moving in and out of the cells. So it doesn't remain associated with the cells necessarily. Some of it will, some of it won't, because of the free permeability of the Coumarin, the AFC. I see. Yeah. So would you, or so is Promega thinking about actually making one that it would remain in the cell? Because with everything moving to the single cell oh, analysis, yeah. mm -hmm. you can imagine actually you would be um, start in the near future studying single cells ATP level and actually take those cells mm -hmm. and further analyze, analyze their RNA and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, we're not making anything like that right now. Um, and to go back to one of my early slides to say our, our objective here was to make plate-based assays. And one way to refer to them is macroscopic. Um, we're just looking at the macroscopic light output of a well. What you're alluding to is microscopic, i.e. imaging based. You'd like to see that single cell and see what's happening there. And there, you know, I would add, there are uh, reagents and, and, and uh, materials that will allow you to do that. I, I didn't talk about any of them today. And the kind of thing you're talking about is not something we have in the pipeline. Yeah. Yes. So it's great to have these uh, sensitive uh, multitude of assays to detect the cytotoxicity. So I'm curious, out of, uh, for example, all the FDA-approved drugs, uh, can you detect the toxicity using these assays? Or for the study, for example, to, to detect a lead comp to identify lead compound for further drug development, what is the rule of thumb? Uh, what kind of assay will be used to... Uh, yeah, to I, I expected that somebody would ask. I mean, it's like, what's the killer assay that'll sort of be the one once and for all um, uh, assay that tells me everything I need to know? And I, I hope one of my messages here is that there isn't one. But, for example, in high throughput my, mode, the ATP assay has been used quite extensively, and it's a very good first pass for high throughput mode screen. So if you're screening a 100,000, 200, 300,000 compound library at 10 micromolar, um, you know, it can tell you a lot about what, what compounds are toxic. Now, typically it'd be done as a secondary screen, so you wouldn't screen the whole library, but so in some cases that's, that's done as a way of annotating the library. Um, in terms of FDA-approved drugs, sure, you know, and we go back to Paracelsus. They're all toxic. Um, it's just uh, a question of how much, you know, how much and how long the exposure time is. Um, and so some of the examples that I showed on there, maybe the prints too small to see, are certainly FDA-approved drugs, or they're drugs that have, maybe they're, they've eventually failed, but they've, they've showed up as research tools. Um, so um, I think something like that uh, triplex assay where we show viability, toxicity, and apoptosis can all be done from the same plate in the same wells really gives you an awful lot of information um, and doesn't take that much more work than doing a single assay. Um, the mechanistic stuff comes along later. Um, uh, perhaps because you have an interesting compound, but you want to know a little bit more about what it's doing. But again, it's always going to 
uh, we always have to be sensitive to dose and time um, and sort of the, the choice of cells we're looking at. Um, I mentioned the hepatocyte um, example where there are certain compounds that are quite toxic to hepatocytes because of their metabolic capacity to transform things. Um, and vice versa, some things that are toxic to say a 293 cell will not be toxic to hepatocytes because they detoxify it. Um, so we have to be sensitive to the cell types we're looking at. I think the multiplexes also um, are, are helpful in cases where we have rare cell types. Hepatocytes, they're not really rare, but they're not cheap either. Um, some of our colleagues use uh, stem cells or other types of primary cells that are a lot harder to get. Um, you know, it breaks my heart to throw cell titer glow onto those cells and destroy them, and that's the only thing I ever see from that well. Um, it'd, be, it, it'd be really helpful, I think, to be able to get multiple endpoints out. And of course, in a high content mode, um, there's great examples of many outputs using multiple antibodies and dyes. Um, Again, we've taken the approach for the add and read sort of plate-based uh, systems. I don't know, did I answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, actually, maybe just add a quick one. Yeah. Uh, if you want to see the cytotoxicity for neuronal cells, are there a particular multiplex assay they would recommend? Um, well, no, not really, because you've got neuronal cells in a dish, and the, you're going to use the same markers as you would for any cell type. So on the other hand, if you want to see neuronal cell death in a mixture of cells, then that's another matter. Um, and I don't have an option for that. Um, we're working on an option for hepatocytes in mixed cultures um, with a leakage marker that would be specific or at least selective for the hepatocytes. And this is becoming more and more popular. Um, instead of using hepatocyte monocultures to use mixtures that more resemble the, the liver. Um, there's a company called Heparogen that they're not really trying to mimic the liver, but they're trying to get better function. And the way they do it is by culturing the hepatocytes in little islands in what they call the hepatopac model. And the islands are surrounded by fibroblasts. The, and, and that supports really, really good, mature uh, phenotype of, of adult liver function in the plate. Problem for tox is you don't know whether you killed the hepatocytes or whether you killed the fibroblasts. So we're kind of working with them on a, on a marker that um, is selective for the hepatocytes. But yeah, I mean, neurons, uh, muscle cells, uh, cancer cells of all kinds of varieties, you know, the markers are, are pretty generic. Um, 